In lieu of Xbox's new direction and embracing a more multi-platform approach with his first party games, gamers of that community debate the strategy. Join us as we continue our look into this Xbox Gamer Civil War and discuss. Xbox gamers argue, if exclusives matter, here's why they do. This is The Medicine. What's up, people? What's up, people? What's up, people? It is your boy, MM2K of Geeks Cloud Dosage and the Hard Knock Digital Culture back again with another episode of The Medicine. This is where we take the big topic of the gaming community discourse and we we, we do like a, a shorter snippet video on it. It's not a full-fledged podcast, but we do a short snippet video and give you our thoughts on the latest gaming topic. All right. And boy, oh boy, do we have a doozy for you today. This one is titled, Xbox Gamers Argue If Exclusives Matter. Here's why they do. Before we get into the heat of this discussion, do us a huge favor, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and rock those bells for notifications, please. We are on the cusp of a thousand subscribers at the time of this recording, and we thank you guys so much, and we just need a little further push just to get over that hump. Thank you so much for your support for now. All right. With that said, we're gonna break this up into a few sections here. Um, and this is gonna be more of a rant than anything. I do have some notes here, but basically I, I'm seeing a lot of things about the exclusivity debate. Honestly, a lot of it not in good faith and a lot of it just siloed and, and, and ignoring of the big picture. So I wanted to address it, all right, today. Let's start off with section one. Let, let, let's look at this argument that's happening here, right? So there has been a debate over the exclusives and the importance of them and, and this debate primarily derives off the fact that um, going into this generation, a large swath of the Xbox community expected Xbox games to be top tier, top of the line, thought that they would be better than the PlayStation games. Um, and therefore that would drive the Xbox console competitively in this AAA drama defining competitive market. It would, it would give Xbox a competitive edge um, to surpass PlayStation or at least run neck and neck with them like they did uh with the with the xbox 360 playstation 3 generation um and, and again a huge part of that in their minds would be xbox's exclusive content um now at the beginning of this generation there were some murmurs that xbox was looking at making certain titles first party titles that is multi-plat beyond multiple platforms they're, they're already doing that with minecraft right and so forth and um they and more and more titles that were surprising to people they the argument was that they would show up on playstation and nintendo platforms and the arguments then were well you know what maybe exclusives don't matter so much i mean the big tent pole games aren't going to go but maybe some of these other games on the periphery if they go multi-plat like the master chief collection even though it's halo somewhere else Ooh, it's it's just a master chief collection it's not going to be anything else who cares right and then bethesda was purchased and phil told us that bethesda was purchased for exclusivity for game pass and we kind of knew that game pass wasn't going to be allowed on any other platform and then abk was purchased and those same gamers that said uh oh, exclusivity really isn't a big deal aha Exclusivity matters because the thought process was that Microsoft would pursue exclusivity with Call of Duty, one of the biggest games, if not the biggest game in the world. And then when they found out that Call of Duty um, couldn't be exclusive for 10 years, um, so what? Activision Blizzard still got other titles, powerful IP that they would then start making exclusive. There was rumors that um, there was this exclusive game that uh, uh, Activision or that Blizzard was working on, a roguelike or something like that. It was supposed to be a big game um, and that it was going to be exclusive to um, Xbox. Ex um, Elder Scrolls 6 was going to be exclusive to Xbox. Starfield was exclusive to Xbox. The moniker, you just have to buy an Xbox, became a big thing, right? Exclusives, again, then matter. But then recently on the heels of 
four well-recognized first-party titles now being multi-plat, and those games were Hi-Fi Rush, Pentiment, uh, Sea of Thieves, and Grounded uh, going elsewhere. Um, and then Xbox giving uh, all indication that, yeah, it's, <laughs> it could be the full slate where it makes sense or where it's plausible. Uh, yeah, th these games are going to start being multi-plat. We're going to provide... Um, an ecosystem to where if you just want to engage with our games and whatever multi-plats we're able to still snag and put on the platform sure you could do that something where you want to engage with game pass great but outside of that we're not trying to battle with playstation anymore so those hopes and dreams that you guys had of us competing in this triple a drama defining space and out, out out performing playstation those hopes are now over right on the advent of that now exclusives again don't matter now the people that I described there, for the most part, were arguing in bad faith. They just basically placate to a rabbit wing of the Xbox audience who just wants to hate on PlayStation on Twitter, or they just are inclined to make excuses for anything Microsoft and their inability to compete in the space, even though they were telling people that they would. Every they they they, they feel like it's their job to make it seem like that every decision that Microsoft made was spot on and they were just moving with the trajectory of the market. They didn't fail anywhere. They, they didn't make any mistakes anywhere, even though Sachi Nadella um, had to remove Game Pass from his compensation package. And we were told earlier that all, all, all these moves were, would be made for Game Pass. The Bethesda uh, move would be for exclusivity in the Game Pass. Now we're seeing Hi-Fi Rush, which is a Bethesda title on a PlayStation and Nintendo platform without it being attached to Game Pass. You know, you know, so those people, they are not arguing in good faith. They are not really part of this discussion. I want to talk to those, however, who are making two arguments. First is the accessibility argument. And as a, as a cloud gamer, ironically, I understand the accessibility argument, but I don't trump quality with accessibility, meaning quality is first and foremost for me. I've been gaming for, for 35 plus years. I've seen the good and bad of gaming. And so therefore the new car smell that are in games, a lot of you guys and gals that are listening to this, maybe you just jumped into gaming or you jumped on the Xbox the last few years and, and, and you, you being exposed to a lot of these games. This is the first time that you've done it because of Game Pass. So Game Pass is great for you. That's fine. And I'm glad that you are now, you have received increased access. But for a gamer like me, and a gamer like me represents more gamers than gamers that just want access at the moment. The average gamer is in their early 30s and they've been playing games for a few decades. So that new car smell isn't there for us. We are focused on quality, whether it's visual, you know, the gameplay loop, all that other stuff, quality has to be enhanced. Like a lot of people were upset with me over Starfield. Starfield, you can do so many things and all this other stuff. Why, why aren't you liking an MM2K? Because those things that you can do in Starfield, I've seen over 10 years ago in Fallout. You know, granted, there are some newer things that you can do, but the lore of a Bethesda game or Bethesda Softworks game is all those multitude of things that you can do in a cohesive journeying experience. And I felt like that was missing out of Starfield. That was at the crux of that experience. So yes, it's a brand new car smell to you being able to do all these things and grab a whole bunch of teacups and sandwiches and stuff like that. I've been doing that for 15 years, 10, 15 years with Bethesda games. I'm over that. Now we're getting down to the meat and potatoes. Most gamers react like that. I understand where if you're new to this or if you're new to Xbox, the exposure to these games in volume is, is, is good enough for you right now. But that new car smell will wear off for you too. When it does, you'll be here with me. I just got here sooner. So accessibility for me doesn't trump quality. I want accessibility to grow. I'm a cloud gamer. I love the accessibility um, notion of it, but we get, it has to grow while maintaining the quality notion, which is increasing the innovation, right? That comes with, the, as far as the expectations with games are concerned. Also, there's this argument about open market. 
like this part i laud more than the accessibility argument i get the accessibility argument but this whole open market thing like publishers will be able to expose your games to more markets i am a gamer i am not a game investor i'm a game consumer all right i do have investments but they're not in gaming f per se i am not an executive at ea i am not some gaming analyst i don't care about open markets in the regards of it trumping quality you get to tell me oh well more people get to play this game i don't care if the game is trash and just so giving publishers an opportunity to 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 open more markets for them to make more money off of bigger gimmicks means nothing to me better quality better innovation all right so that open argument thing you know and again nothing personal against anybody but it's trash i don't care about it and again the average gamer does not care about op the open um market argument nothing trumps quality right and when it comes to exclusives we're we've seen less of them this generation versus even the, the seventh generation right because games are getting more and more expensive and so platform holders do have to look at the fact that you know hey how do we fund these how do we maintain the quality but deal with the the, the rise in costs so there are cons don't get me wrong but see with less exclusives around and we put more in the hands of these publishers who are greedy that are looking for money hats and gimmicks all we're seeing now is just polished versions of games that we saw two generations ago like if you look at games like bioshock and mass effect right like we're just seeing iterations of those games that were exclusive that were innovative way back when we're just seeing publishers now just trying to regurgitate those experiences and not really doing the best job of it right so in contrast when you look at the AAA genre defining exclusives i'm not saying they're on the same ilk of the seventh generation games as far as the innovation but they do tend to become better they come out better look at the games that are coming out from other publishers in totality versus the exclusive games the exclusive games have a better hit ratio and i'm about to show you why and the proof is in the pudding when you go look at the the the, the top uh acclaimed games of the year even though even if the exclusive game doesn't win more of them fill up the categories of best game of the year best you know what i'm saying they have a better hit ratio why is that i'm going to show you why and in order to do so let's go to the investment argument all right so in order for me to do that let's do this let's talk about investment this is a story older story from 2014 where it breaks down why playstation has been so good the last few generations with his with its exclusive content it says share your sheet only four out of ten playstation games make money but sony will always support talent what is yeshua talking about here well first let's read this he says it's a hit driven business we look at our financial results of the titles and probably three or four out of the ten make money and maybe one or two make all the money to cover the cost of the other titles so we have to be able to maintain that hit ratio at a certain level to be able to continue in this business so we always try to find out and support and help grow the talent that's what that's the most important work that i believe myself and uh, my management team at worldwide studios are doing what is he explaining here he's explaining to people that look we have this box that we have to sell you in order for us to sell you this box the distinguishing features alone cannot be just the features itself that's not going to work 
prime example xbox one generation and and now the current xbox series generation loaded with features i would say loaded with features and even i'll do the playstation the last two generations but they got beat handedly by uh x they got hit, beat handily by playstation the xbox the og xbox even though they did have one heavily sought after exclusive in halo they had a whole bunch of feature sets the hard drive and the broadband blew the, the 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 playstation 2 out of the water why did those three consoles fail in competing being a competitive threat to the playstation it's the games now we look at the xbox 360 generation has those abundance of feature sets but what did they have this time they had more of the critically acclaimed games than playstation when it comes to gaming i know we like to make comparisons to other things i showed you on videos past uh, a subscription service is not going to turn a tide in gaming because gaming is different gaming is dynamic every time i boot up uh, a call of duty or fortnite it's a different experience so i don't need to to, to binge on games the average gamer doesn't need to binge because of that dynamic nature of games so a subscription service isn't going to suit the average gamer you guys also are erroneously making comparison to other media when it comes to the importance of feature sets when it comes to devices and not being enough to drive a device is different for games we i gave you four console generations the sixth generation seventh generation eighth generation and now the ninth generation feature sets did not win the day for xbox it took exclusive games to do that right exclusive games won the day for xbox yoshida understands this he understands the importance of this and how important it is for those exclusive high quality games to drive the sale of the box and, and, and be the difference maker when you make a choice because most gamers have to make a choice and that's why they will continue to invest in it and that's why when it comes to them because these exclusives aren't everywhere their purpose is just to drive the sale of the box so you can buy the multiplats with them rather than elsewhere because that's where the real money is at so because i gotta lure you or i at least gotta lure the hardcore who then lures the casuals because i need that th that lure initiative there's a bigger sense of emergency when it comes to my exclusive because my exclusive is not just about selling you the exclusive the exclusive is a lure to the box so i'm using this exclusive to lure you to something that's four or five hundred dollars so because of that price point that i'm trying to lure you to it's more imperative that this game is great and fantastic opposed to me just trying to convince you to buy something for 60 or 7 70 bucks and because it's a multi-plat triple a game that's on multiple consoles i have a bigger hit ratio so maybe i ain't got to focus that much on quality maybe if i come up with a good enough gimmick you know i got more chances on more platforms that's good enough that just helps the publisher but what helps the gamer is quality because again it's not about the sale of the exclusive yoshida just told you 60 percent of these games are going to fail on their own but they have a bigger purpose they're to lure you to that four or five hundred dollar purchase so these in order to lure you to such a big purchase these games got to be great they have to be quote unquote system sellers where the multi-plats purely in the hands of these publishers don't have to be system sellers. We're just trying to apply a gimmick that hopefully we'll, we'll see financial benefit from. You see how we get better games from exclusives because of the, uh, of the dynamic that they cause, the sense of urgency behind them? But it's not just that, it's the logistics. I'm gonna show you guys something else. This is something that is argued since the beginning of time of game development square enix explains why final fantasy 16 is a playstation 5 exclusive 
Square Enix ended up liking Sony's offer the most and decided to make it a PlayStation 5 exclusive. Yoshida added, developing for one system is easier and the team has gotten help from PlayStation. That's it from a developer and programmer perspective. Limiting development to one system makes it only easier on us but allows us the ability to optimize it, he said. And that allows us the ability to maximize performance for one system because we're only concentrating on that system. He added, it allows us to create the game that we want and create it, it and it makes it easier for us to do that what is he saying by us focusing our resources and that wearing ourselves thin trying to balance out logistics for for launching on all these different platforms and worrying about bugs here and how this game us being that we can just focus on this one platform at least at launch we make a better game for it. We may, Not only do we make a better game because of the investment of cash that they're giving us that I talked about earlier, because these guys have a sense of urgency that this game has to sell boxes. But what also happens is that we don't have to spend more resources on multiple platforms. We can, our people are, it's going to be more likely that our people are going to tweak this game and get the best out of it because all we got to do is worry about one platform. Now, Square Enix has worked out a deal with, with Microsoft. We don't know what that entails. It could be that Final Fantasy 16 does see the light of day somewhere else. But it'll be a better game by the time it lands on Xbox because they didn't have to worry about and spread their resources too thin to worry about Xbox 2 at launch. They created the game that they wanted to create, and then now, after it launched on PlayStation, they can now take those resources and just carry that game, that game over to PlayStation, utilize what they learned from the PlayStation launch, and likely come out with a better game that's gonna land on Xbox. We've seen that with Mass Effect. We've seen that with Bioshock. With the problems that there was with PlayStation 3. Trying to release those games day and date on the PlayStation 3 would have been a problem. It would have ran resources dry. The fact that it wasn't exclusive means that Bioshock and Mass Effect wouldn't have got that infusion in cash from Microsoft, meaning that it probably wasn't going to be the quality game that we all know and love. And there would have been more gimmicks infused in that experience. Ken Levine of the creative minds of Bioshock told you that if it wasn't for uh, Bill Gates and company, that their investment and their help in getting this game pushed out, that Bioshock would have never seen the light of day. And I argue that the Bioshock that we've come to know and love, the one that has influenced so many titles generations afterwards, it wouldn't have been the same game. They, they, would have, they would have had to scale back and cut back on some things. All right. And that's a perfect segue into the next. The results of multi plot hood. I want to give you guys a prime example of leaving these AAA drama defining experiences. If these games would have been multi plat from day one instead of at least a timed exclusive, where they got that infusion in cash because they needed to be a system seller. If you take that dynamic, that aspect out of the game, let's look at a franchise that is the prime example of what happens when you have that dynamic versus when you don't have that dynamic. Oh yeah, I'm going there, baby. <laughs> the infamous Mass Effect 3 ending that led to lawsuits. How did this come about? Let me just read you and what some of the people were saying about Mass Effect 3. They said, consider this. If you had purchased a game for $59.99 and were told that you had to complete control over the game's outcome by the choices your character made and then actually had no control over the game's outcome, wouldn't you be disappointed? This issue at stake here is, did Bioware falsely advertise? Technically, yes, they did, said Marjorie Stevens, Director of Communications at Better Business Bureau of Northern India. What's being talked about here? Well, because 
Mass Effect 1 and 2 were huge hits. And there was an injection of cash by Microsoft for Mass Effect 1 and 2. 3, they plan to release multiplat day one. So Microsoft said, there's no incentive for us to give you an infusion in cash. You got this one on your own, bucko. Have a wonderful day. EA then creates a game without Microsoft's assistance in the way that they assisted before to where they got to be concerned with this new dynamic of the used game market where people are buying games over and over again. And even though people are buying a title four, five, six fold in the used game market, the act uh, EA only benefits from the sale once. So they're like, this is actually cutting into our profits because of the used game market. Once somebody beats the game and returns it and then, you know, rinse and repeat four or five times over, they're not buying the new copy. So we're missing out on sales. So what did EA do? They said they did something unprecedented that led to this lawsuit. They said, you know what? A, we're going to force you, if you want to see all the endings, we're going to force you to have to play the multiplayer. And in order for you to play the multiplayer, you A, got to buy a new copy, or B, if you have a used copy, you got to buy an online license. That gives us a cut from all the online. Otherwise, you're not going to play, you're not going to see all the endings. In order to force you to see all the endings, this is where the lawsuit comes in, we are going to make the endings as vague as possible. Very vague. Now, I, 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 from, I had some good quote unquote inside information from way back when from people close to to uh bioware um from a discussion that i had in 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 a, in a, in a room that um bioware wanted there not to be 100 percent finality to the game in order to understand that you got to understand the robotech series and how those arcs ended the first ser- uh, part of the arc um uh, was kind of vague in its ending. Then you jump to the second arc and people were like, what the hell is happening? And it all made sense by the third arc, right? That's what Bioware was looking for. But the way that the endings occur, they that was driven totally by EA because EA had these vague, just like these, the, the, these thumbnail scenes <laughs> that were ultra vague. And that would have then forced you to say, well, damn, I probably need to go and replay the, oh damn. I thought I was just gonna be satisfied by playing the game without having to indulge in the online multiplayer. Now I, it looks like I am gonna have to play the online multiplayer, do the things I need to do there to open up the backdrop of the game. So that translate to me being able to see more endings. And then by the time you got through all the endings, they were all, you find out they were all vague. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's what led to this lawsuit. You don't have that dynamic. If Microsoft again is involved or even PlayStation, even if it's a PlayStation exclusive, if somebody is involved giving them that fusion of cash and saying, Hey, look, because this is going to be an exclusive, we need it to help push consoles. You can't do that. You don't have that oversight as well. That led to what you saw with Mass Effect 3. Prime example that when you leave games in the hands of these publishers, AAA expensive games at that, they will go and try to money hat any way that they can versus when you have the oversight and the infusion of cash that comes from these platform holders, they're less inclined to do that because there's a sense of urgency that the platform holder is gonna say, oh, no, 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 no. You can't do that. That's not going to fly or that's going to hurt our brand if you try something like that. When it's up in the hands of the publishers, we see time after time, they're just thinking about gimmick. We gotta do a gimmick. We gotta take this, we, we, you know, this game is expensive and we got our shareholders looking at, we, 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 we gotta try it. 
it may work. We got a good feeling about this. And we're seeing time after time, again, most of these multi-plat publisher-led exclusives, they're conveyor belt, they're lacking innovation, there are a few exceptions, you know, and gamers lose out because of it. So what is the conclusion here? What, what, what is the grand message here? I think the grand message is you cannot have blinders on and not know the history of the games that you're playing now. The games that you're playing now are from a time where people were these platform makers were willing to lose billions of dollars. I think in the the if my numbers are right, I think in the, the, the seventh generation alone, the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 generation, Xbox and PlayStation lost a total of $10 billion combined because things were so competitive. Now, I'm not saying that these companies can lose money forever. They got to balance things out. You know, like, like even PlayStation right now, they realize we got to come up with a more balanced way to approach these, these games. And so we're going to have less of our first party games that would be exclusive. We're going to pursue more second party and third party timed exclusives because that's more fathomable financially. But when we do drop our first party games, they are going to be stellar because they got to push the box. And PlayStation 5 is slaying it. They're, they're just killing it. They're killing the competition because of that. When you pull that dynamic away of needing to sell the box, you don't get the best quality games. You don't influence the market. And even those of you that really aren't even big on these exclusives, because let's be honest, most people don't buy the exclusives. Most people are still influenced by the exclusives though. How? They're influenced because they see where the hardcore gamers are going before they're even thinking about getting a next generation console. And they, if they all if they see them all flocking here, that's where I'm going to go. That's where all the brainiacs and the nerds are going. They know the most about where the game. So I'm going to follow them and B, even if you don't buy the exclusives, even if you don't buy God of War, even if you don't buy Spider-Man, even if you didn't buy Bioshock or Mass Effect, understand that the games that you're playing today have been influenced by those games of success. Bioshock in so many ways defines the games that you're playing now. All the Warhammer games and and even Atomic Heart and so like Bioshock just flipped the script, just flipped the narrative of the AAA drama defining um, action RPG. Demon Souls, the original Demon Souls. You know how many Souls games there are out there now, or Souls like games? We even got souls like shooters in Remnant 2. And I don't even play the souls, the, the, the core souls games, but I love Remnant 2. Even when you don't buy those exclusive games, they are influencing the market. We are getting better games because of the dynamic. This is coming from a cloud gamer who primarily games on the video GeForce Now Ultimate. Great service, by the way. Check it out. I was playing Banishers the other day in 4K, 120 frames per second on the cloud. Amazing. You got to check it out. But it, that, that, that's another story. And go to clouddosage.com to see that 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 uh, that gameplay or uh, go to Cloud Dosage News on YouTube in order to see that. But that's another video. That being said. They're influencing the quality game. So we got it. So as long as I need you to invest in my box or hell, even my ecosystem or my service, as long as I have that dynamic. But I think the biggest um, dynamic is the box because I'm asking you to pay so much. I need you to buy this box. I need you to whip out that $500. So because of that sense of urgency, I got to make sure that this game is great. There's got to be extra oversight on this game, right? 
because of that, we're getting better games because of it. No, 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 no doubt about it. <laughs> I couldn't even get that out. No doubt about it. So as a gamer, we got to look at the broad picture. We got to look at this for 5,000 feet. I understand what our individual buying habits are, but we got to understand how the games are being influenced. We got to understand the set of dominoes that have been pushed in making gaming better before said dominoes come our way. Don't follow these creators that feel like that they got to defend a multi-trillion dollar company over the sake of what's best for you, the gamer. Know the history. Do the research. Check out our videos here. Go back and just pull up. Look at the most influential games uh, between... This is what you could do. What were the most influential games between 2005 and 2013 before you started gaming? And go look at the history and the articles that were coming out about those games. Do your research. Understand how we got here. Then you'll understand, regardless if you purchase them directly or not, why exclusives matter. They matter to you. And they're bringing you better games because of it. With that said, that's it from your board. Let me know what you think about all this in the comment section below. Because like I always say, who cares what I think? But if you did like what I had to say, check out the links below to follow me. They will lead you to Geeks, Cloud Dosage, and Hard Knock Digital Culture. With that said, peace. Have a wonderful, wonderful gaming day.